as we go on to Joe, we could sharpen it a little bit. And I'd like to just read uh, the quote uh, from your article, your quote of a key sentence written by Richard Wright and ask you to expand on that. Uh, Richard Wright wrote, Negro writers must accept the nationalist implications of their lives, not in order to encourage them, but in order to change and transcend them. That was uh, the key sentence from Richard Wright that you quoted, uh, of which the last part was elided by Cedric Robinson significantly. So um, if you can go from that to talk about the, uh, the different aspects of the tradition and what we can learn from them. I think one way to answer your question, Victor, I mean, to think about uh, the ways in which engagement with a particular position, a particular condition of oppression, you know, black experience, black oppression, racialized oppression, to the question of how, to what degree can engagement with that situation, past or present, transcend itself, you know, is, you know, one way to get at that would be to, to think of, you know, the degree to which black cultural production and, and radical black cultural production has been able to resonate historically beyond, you know, only those who have immediately experienced black uh, oppression in those terms. I mean, I, my, you know, my uh, plan for my opening comment tonight was to talk a little bit about, you know, how black cultural production had kind of reached me, even though I grew up in, you know, a very, very white, all too white suburb on the North Shore of Massachusetts. And yet somehow, right, black cultural production, black, black social resistance kind of reached me and kind of, you know, cut through, you know, the bubble of the kind of demography, you know, dem demographics wasn't simply destiny insofar as the black radical tradition. And here I'm thinking in my own life about, you know, the, the, the Los Angeles rebellions that followed the, the outrageous verdict exonerating the, the torturers of Rodney King back in the early 1990s. But I'm also thinking about literary and cultural production. And, you know, and, um, you know, it was a Richard Wright book that I pulled off the shelf, sick home from school in eighth grade, feverish, uh, you know, kind of del semi delirious with, with, with fever. It was a Richard, it was Richard Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, a book he wrote in 1938 and republished with an ex expanded version in 1940 that, you know, it knocked my socks off, right? And, and illuminated me not only to the kind of objective facts and the historical reality of black oppression in America, specifically the, you know, black oppression during the Jim Crow white supremacist period in the, in the South, but, but, but also illuminated me to this, this history of resistance and a history of resistance that was making it clear that this fight for, for black humanity, for black equality, this fight against white racism was potentially and aspired to be a universal fight or a fight that needed to be and ought to be joined by people that had been raised to consider themselves white, by people who uh, might not be in the extreme depravity and extreme vulnerability and experiencing this extreme level of, of state violence that Wright depicted in a book like Uncle Tom's Children, which I, I hope folks will read if they have not. I think it still holds up in a powerful way today. Um, but you know the, that I was I was moved by this 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 revelation of the history of a resistance that wasn't simply calling for inclusion in what existed. It wasn't simply a call for liberal integration, nor was it simply uh, a, a call for resistance that spoke only to black people, but that was that was overtly, in the case of Richard Wright in the 1930s, evoking the particularities of black oppression as a way to shed light on the need for a kind of a socialist revolution that would unite with poor and working class whites within this country, but also especially would unite with oppressed people and working class people around the world, an internationalist vision, an anti-imperialist vision. And I, and I felt in Wright since, you know, I was since eighth grade, I've, I've come a long way, although I was hardly ever assigned Richard Wright's work in school, I should mention, whether in college or grad school, but as a scholar in the last five to 10 years, you know, I've come around to the view that still sees Richard Wright in particular as a very important voice, particularly on this question, of, you know, that I, I feel like that at least he holds out, he represents for me the unfinished project of being fully attentive to the particularities and the severity of black oppression without without 
without without framing um, that oppression as a uniquely black property, which is to say, he, he engages, I think, the dialectics of race and class in a way that a lot of folks, a lot of conversations today could benefit from engaging. And yet I, I, I fear that, as you, you alluded to Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, this, you, you, this currently kind of ubiquitous work that a lot of people are alluding to and perhaps fewer people are reading, but nonetheless is popping up all over the place. I do feel like there is a particular framing of a Black radical tradition uh, these days that um, that literally kind of cuts out of that tradition some of, I wouldn't say all of, but some of the openings to build the struggle uh, for Black liberation as an explicitly um, universal struggle, a common struggle that can be and must be and ought to be joined broadly, uh, which is not to say that, that the conditions faced by poor whites or poor Mexicans or poor Latinos or whatever are identical, but there, there, are, there is enough of a common substance of that struggle that one, that one can speak of genuine kind of the potential for genuine mass-based organic alliance and comradeship. It's not simply a matter of white guilt, you know, ethical imperatives to, to, to reduce the harm on the other, that there is a common anchor in common interests, a common enemy, a common threat, of course, the threats in the 30s and the threats today, some are the same, some are different, some are new. I know, Victor, you, you know, I can't talk to you without thinking about the ecological crisis, which, you know, threatens us all, albeit in different ways and all of our, you know, uh, generations to come in different ways. Um, I mean, so, I mean, I don't know if I'm, if I've been pre prepared to, to sharply answer your question, but it seems to me one of my concerns today and out of which that Socialism and Democracy article has come, uh, you know, that, that was linked earlier in the chat, engaging Robert Robinson is right, is that I think it's important for us to not lose those elements of the black radical and black revolutionary tradition, which were not just, you know, agnostic or potentially open to building a, an international multiracial fight, but who foregrounded that, right? Who foregrounded that not only as a political necessity, but as an objective possibility, realizing that, in, to put it in blunt words, capitalism was fucking over most white people too, albeit in very different ways, right? Than, than perhaps um, ghettoized black folks or Jim Crow, you know, terrorized black folks in, in, in the, you know, the 1930s South. And that there was a common basis for unity. Now, and figuring out what that common basis is, I think is a, is a work in progress. And, and certainly I appreciated Kazembe's remarks in his attention to the need to situate black and radical cultural responses in their, in their place and time, right? We shouldn't, and, and that's in fact, one of my other concerns, I feel like that there is, there is sometimes in, a, in some invocations of black radical traditions, the suggestion that nothing has changed, right? That, that the best way to understand mass incarceration today is just to call it the new Jim Crow, or that the best way to, to describe policing today is just to call it them the new, you know, or the, 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 the new iteration of slave patrols. I do think that Richard Wright's work also stands out in its attention to the particular conditions of black oppression in its time. It, it, it pushes back against the kind of the danger of anachronism, the, the danger of relying on kind of mythology of the past rather than a concrete examination of concrete conditions. So, I mean, the, I'm not trying to say that Richard Wright's, you know, uh, diagnosis, you know, or his prescriptions can be just applied today. But I do, I did find as a young person growing up, even in the white, you know, upper middle class suburbs of, of Massachusetts, albeit with socialist parents who had, you know, hid their socialism from me till I was 18. And then I got the real story of what they were doing in Florissant, Missouri, right down the street from Ferguson, actually, literally a couple miles from where Michael Brown was, was shot to death uh, and where the Ferguson rebellion kind of made this conversation possible perhaps that we're having right now in some ways. But I do see in right uh, the spark and the potential, the revolutionary resonance that exists in actually existing black radical culture. And my fear is that some iterations and ways of rekindling and re kind of restating and representing that black radical tradition, some versions of it actually tend to elide from that tradition precisely what makes it radical and revolutionary, which is its potential, not only potential, the actuality of its resonance beyond, beyond those in whose name it may immediately speak. So, I mean, I guess my, my interest here tonight, you know, among other things is what is universal, right? What is in that black experience, not only the experience of oppression, but of resistance, what is it that, that others even outside of the black community themselves can and need to learn from not just the, the, uh, the oppression of black people, but their 
experience, the contradictory and learning experience of pushing back against that oppression, that, that, that very severe oppression and exploitation. And for me, I guess this would be the final point I'll make on Richard Wright, and then I'll kick it back to you, uh, Victor and Linda, and, and on to Johanna and Eric, is to say, I think Richard Wright was, was also unique, uh, or I mean, was rare in the sense of how, how openly he was willing to admit that a struggle against oppression could be, on the one hand, utterly justified and utterly even necessary, but also strategically in need of development. That is to say, he was very resistant to the what, what, what some Marxists might call the fetishization of spontaneity. And I know that's a loaded word, and I'm not trying to say that every riot is spontaneous, that there isn't planning and that there isn't cultural work that's done outside of a party meeting or something, you know, a communist party mm -hmm. meeting. But but I do want to suggest that Wright was uniquely, and in, in my view, he was exceptional in his willingness to both unite with the the ethos, the energy that was going into the resistance, you know, the individualist resistance, the the the, the black man who goes down shooting at the people that are going to lynch him or whatever. But also in recognizing the need to create strategic space that could allow resist could basically allow for more than resistance. In fact, my, one of my pet peeves these days is the way the word resistance operates as a slippery slope term that you know resistance of course only has meaning dialectically in res in relationship to some opposition what are you resisting mm -hmm. and i do feel like the term resistance has become such a catch all that we often don't connect it enough to the question of strategy right resistance is, is i mean i do think wherever <laughs> there's oppression there will be resistance but that alone doesn't decide whether or not you will be slaughtered or you will actually overthrow the oppressor and, and open up a revolutionary space for a true change, true radical change in social conditions. So I think Richard Wright, one of the reasons he may be un less popular these days than he needs to be, in my view, even in black radical kind of circles or circles talking about black radicalism is because he confronts us with a very uncomfortable, I think, truth or fact, and that is oppression oppresses people. And I'm not just talking about black people, but you know, Capitalism fucks people up and alienates people, even from their own desires. There's a huge gap between what people in Richard Wright's novels think and what they say out loud. There's a huge gap between what they think and what they're able to actually do. There's a huge gap between what they, they know is, po is possible and what they're willing to act based on how well they trust the people around them or don't. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Richard Wright's important in relationship to the current resurgence of black radical tradition thought or whatever, in the sense that he, uh, he, he conjures the revolutionary universality that is imminent to black struggle, not just projected onto it from the outside, but also he's not afraid to be critical and to, and, and to simultaneously honor resistance without fetishizing it as if it's the end game.